All right, I'm going to uh, hand out the syllabus. Um, and uh, why don't you go ahead and pass, pass these around. Okay, so that way. Um, before I take roll, just to uh, give you an idea, I, what I did was I, um, there's a, a Wolfram folder that's in Box, and I sent you all a link to that. So you should be able to get in Box and use that link to get to the Wolfram folder. And in that Wolfram folder, you see that there's all sorts of classes in there, my other, my other classes, but Econ 105 is in there. So um, in, that, uh, in that folder, uh, I just have um, things that you are, um, just have things that you're going to possibly uh, uh, use to expand your knowledge on different things, like there's a minimum wage section and et cetera, just different articles that might, you might want to use to expand your knowledge on things. Um, it is, uh, uh, the required books are all on your, um, on your syllabus there. Um, so the required books are a capitalist manifesto. Um, okay, and this is really a, um, the, the, the basis for the class. Uh, and for example, uh, one of the other books you're going to read is The Law by Bastiat. There's a little, there's a chapter in here on the law, right? Um, there is uh, the other, you know, you're going to read The Constitution of Liberty. So there's going to be, there's a chapter in here discussing the Constitution of Liberty. Um, there's a chapter on um, How the West Grew Rich, uh, which is an, another book that you're going to be taking a look at. So um, the, again, the required texts are this Capitalist Manifesto, The Law by Bastiat, Liberalism by Ludwig von Mises, uh, The Constitutional Liberty by Hayek, um, and again, How the West Grew Rich by Brzezell and Rosenberg. Um, so those should all be available uh, from the bookstore or they're available uh, on, you guys know how to use the magic of the internet to find stuff, yeah. Um, you don't have to bring it to class, all right? Um, uh, but the, if you want to know, you know, uh, I do go, go over demand and supply curves in here. Um, there may be a few. How many have had Econ 202 already? Nobody? Okay. That's good. Um, so uh, th there would be some demand and supply curve information in here. Um, if you have access to a regular principles of economics textbook, that would be perhaps useful, uh, but all the information that you need is, is in here. But if you wanted to, uh, you know, go into it in more detail or uh, whatever, then you can, you know, it should, it should all be contained in here, but if you wanted to go into more detail, if you have access to a principles, we'll do, in fact, why don't I just go over the uh, syllabus right now. Um, so there are, again, uh, the acquired texts are, and they're all in paperback. Um, the uh, liberalism you can get in a PDF, I think, from um, the Mises.org, the Ludwig von Mises Institute, Mises.org. Uh, you may be able to download a PDF uh, from that if you, but if you want hard copy, it's, you know, it's not expensive. Um, I was looking at some of these textbooks are like, $250, right? Pretty high. Um, they must think, well, we'll talk about this, that the, <laughs> the demand is pretty inelastic for them. So, um, all right. Now, um, there is, if you uh, get on the college's website, we have online courses. Um, I did the Econ 101 online course, um, and they are a series of uh, 35 to 40 minute lectures on different topics. So if you get on there, um, for example, um, uh, you know, there's one on demand, there's one on supply and equilibrium, there's one on uh, the role of profit, et cetera, all the things that we're going to cover. So, uh, you know, if you uh, 
want to expand your knowledge a little bit more, again, you can, you know, you can take a look at, uh, take a look at that. Um, all right, um, there's going to be two midterms, one take-home essay, and a final. Um, each of the midterms is worth, and this is all here, but each of the midterms is worth 25% of your grade. The, the, the final um, is worth 40% of your grade, and the take-home essay is worth 10% of your grade. Now, the take-home essay is basically just an essay question dealing with, it's a long essay question, dealing with what we do in the last week of class. In the last week of class, we do some macroeconomic stuff. Um, some, uh, you know, sort of the uh, big picture for the economy as a whole, what would happen if, uh, so, so you'll be able to understand why in a recession did uh, Barack Obama want to have a stimulus package, right? So in the last uh, uh, big recession, 2008, 2009, there was a stimulus package. Um, why did the Federal Reserve make interest rates near zero? Why, why are interest rates near zero right now with the Federal Reserve trying to deal with the uh, coronavirus pandemic? Okay? So you, 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 in that last week, we'll quickly go over that. Now, probably won't be able to absorb that in time to be able to answer an essay question in three days um, uh, and an essay question in class. So it will be a, uh, the take home essay will be dealing with the macroeconomics piece. Uh, I'll hand it out or I'll probably put it uh, in the Wolfram folder and box. Um, and uh, uh, you'll be able to work on it on your own, right? It's, it's, a, it's a take home open book, um, just, not supposed to have somebody else write it for you, okay? So we sort of got that idea. Um, but it'll be a, uh, so as long as you, you could, uh, you know, uh, if you don't understand something, you could ask somebody, right? But, um, so anyway, that's the, uh, an important aspect of that. All right, so the final's worth 40% of the grade, and you might say, well, gee, why is the final worth so much? And it's because the final's cumulative. So I will cover some things on the final. The final will be weighted more towards the things that we have in the last third of the class, but the final will include some of the stuff from the beginning, okay? So that way you don't compartmentalize and say, oh, I learned this part, eh, throw that out of my brain, make room for the second part, throw that out, make room for the third part. You, you don't get to do it that way, right? So, um, so the, the, even though the, the final's worth a large percentage of your grade, you will, uh, you will have already answered some of those questions uh, beforehand uh, or something very similar. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the final, although it seems to be heavily weighted, all, half your grade's gonna come in at the end, but if you got 95% on the first exam, you're probably going to do well on the final part that deals with that part of it. If you got 50% on the first exam, you get another shot at it at the end. Okay, so that's part of why you know I've been teaching this class for 30 years, so uh, that's part of, uh, of of why we do it that way. Uh, your grade may be adjusted for attendance. That is, I may call roll. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of people in the class. I'm not going to call roll every time. Uh, but, uh, and the way it'll work is, let's say you're on the border between a B and a B plus. If what I, when I look at your grades uh, and I'm trying to decide whether to give you the B plus or the B and you've missed you know, three times you weren't there, uh, then you're probably not going to get the B plus. Okay? So it's not like I have a certain, you know, if you miss three classes, it goes down by half a point or something like that. It's just, when I'm, if, if you're on borderline, then I'm going to, uh, then I'll, uh, your grade will be adjusted that way. Okay, first midterm, October 5th, okay, that's, so that's a Monday. Um, you're probably not going to like this, but we're not going to have class on that Wednesday before break. Okay, so you're, in case you were thinking about going home or something, uh, we won't have class on the Wednesday before, uh, before our break there. 
All right. Um, we will. We. It is. Um, we have three um, extra classes. Um, along, well, first of all, the second midterm is going to be on uh, Monday, November 9th. Okay, so that's when the second midterm is. You don't need a blue book for the exams. It'll be a. Uh, you'll be able to answer the exam on the. Uh, what I'll do is I'll have ten multiple choice, ten true false, and four or five essay questions. And uh, you know it'll say you know the question number one will be up here, and then there'll be a blank spot so you can write in. So you don't have to bring a blue book for the uh, for the for those midterms um, or for the final either. Um, we will have um, review sessions before each of the midterms and a review session before the finals. So you're going to get three extra classes. Uh, you know they're not mandatory, but they are. People usually find them uh, uh, find them useful. Um, so I have this on here. The first review session will be Saturday, October third. Second review session will be Saturday, November seventh, and the third review session will be Saturday, uh, December fifth. Okay. Um, I know there's a reading day, but two of my three sections have their, uh, have their exams before the reading day, so it's not very useful for a review session um, to have it after the exam. So the review session will be on that, 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 that Saturday. All right. Um, Office hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1 to 2. Now I teach from 9 till 12, so I'm obviously not in the office in the mornings uh, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Office hours are going to be 1 to 2 on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and in the mornings on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, uh, 9 to 11. Now, I am in my office usually much more often than that. Um, you are, and I'll, I leave my door open, you're free to just stop in any time that, you know, if I'm in, you know, if it's like, if it's 2 o'clock on a Thursday, uh, you can just come by my office and uh, if I'm in, fine, right? So this is when I, this is times when I, uh, tr uh, I will try to be in there, uh, well, I'll, I will be in there on, on those times. Yes? Where is your office located? It's in 322, so it's in the far corner, uh, two floors up. All right. Um, if you want to make an appointment, that's fine as well. If you say, "Gee, I really, you know, I want to. I got a real question. I'm going to come in at. Uh, I want to come in at two o'clock on Thursday, or I want to come in at two thirty on Wednesday. Uh, we can arrange for uh, uh, for other times. All right. Um, Uh, the uh, uh, give you the object of the course, et cetera, and give you the outline. So um, at the at the bottom here, it tells you when we are moving to the other uh, uh, the other books and the sections of that. So we'll we'll start out with the Capitalist Manifesto, um, and then we'll do uh, Mises um, in section three, uh, Mises, and then Bastiat, and then Hayek, and then. Brzezel and Rosenberg are for the section four. That's how the West grew rich. It's a history of the, you know, why is it that we went for thousands of years and everybody living, uh, you know, like refugees, and then all of a sudden you guys all have cell phones. Okay, you know, I tell my, you know, when I was your age, you couldn't lose your phone. It's stuck on the wall back at the house. Okay, it ain't going anywhere. Right. Um, so the world has changed significantly, and so why is it that we look very different than what it looked like uh, years ago? All right. There's old exams are in the uh, Wolfram folder in box. Now, it that is an important thing for you to do, is to take a look at the old exams. My exams are not going to surprise you. Okay. Um, there's going to be, I can tell you, there's going to be a question on the first midterm that's going to deal with demand and supply curves. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, something's going to happen, which will, you'll know, okay, that shifted the demand curve to the left. Uh, if the demand curve shifted to the left, 
then the price fell and quantity went down, et cetera, okay? So it is important to take a look at the old exams and to study from them. So when you, the, you only have 50 minutes to do 10 multiple choice, 10 true, false, and either four or five essay questions. What does that mean? You should have thought what the questions were gonna be and figured out the answers to them before you walked in there. If the first time that you're thinking about, um, uh, f first, you know, the f first time you're thinking about what does Bastiat say will happen uh, uh, if uh, the government engages in what he calls legalized plunder, if the first time you're thinking about that is when you're reading it in the exam, you're not gonna have time to do it, okay? So you're gonna find out, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm almost always gonna ask you a question about what does legal, Bastiat say is legalized plunder and what does he say will happen, et cetera. You can see there's a lot of people in the class, right? So, and um, with the COVID thing, um, you know, everybody's wearing masks, like you should be wearing a mask, okay? Um, and just to tell you, uh, my wife called me this morning and a person that she was working with on getting the, um, uh, getting the Dawn Theater uh, organ restored just died of COVID. So it, it's out there in Hillsdale, so uh, as, you know, don't take it, I mean, you have to, when we're going to talk about marginal benefit, marginal cost, et cetera, okay? So, um, the, you know, the marginal benefit of wearing a mask is probably greater than the marginal cost of wearing a mask. So uh, if you wanna make a rational choice about it, which we'll talk about in the class, um, then it makes sense uh, 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 to do that. All right, so um, anyway, it's useful to get together in small groups and discuss the questions yourself. Now, you might say, well, gee, I know the answer. Why should I tell somebody else the answer, right? Well, the way, the, the way I uh, score it is that if you get 90% and above at the end of the semester, you get an a, at least an A minus. So everybody could get an A in the class, right? It's not like I don't do it on a curve. Um, if you get 80% and above, you're gonna get at least a B minus. If you get, you have to get 60% to get a C minus, all right? So I'm, I'm sort of, no. It's infrequent that people get less than 60%. You already know what most of the questions are, you know, and this isn't rocket surgery. Um, so that, uh, you know, you should be able to, you know, you should be able to handle it. Um, so, uh, uh, so if, when you answer your essay question, you're gonna be explaining to me what's gonna happen, right? I wanna be able to, to, to read, your essay read your answer to your essay question so you're explaining to me what it is, all right? So if you can explain it to the other person in the group, what does that do? That helps you answer the essay question for yourself because you'll figure out, you know, they'll ask a question and go, wow, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. I, I, you know, I know it went from A, point A went to point B, and I know we're supposed to end up at point D, but I can't really remember how we got from B to D, okay? So to the extent that you can get together with a couple people and go over the exams, the, uh, people have found that to be helpful. Now, you, you don't have to, but I'm just saying, you know, in the history of the course, um, that's, that's uh, what, uh, what, you'll find, uh, what you'll find useful. Um, again, I don't use Blackboard other than this, okay? That's the Blackboard I use. The only time I use Blackboard is when I use Blackmail. And um, Blackmail is how you use Blackboard to send out emails. So the email that you got on the, uh, the email that you got on the link to the Wolfram folder, I used Blackboard for that. But other than that, you know, it's not on Blackboard. So I know a lot, a lot of professors use Blackboard, although I guess we're not gonna be using it next year or whatever. Um, so, uh, but I don't, I don't use Blackboard. Anything that I'm, uh, anything that we've got old, uh, like I said, the old exams, um, uh, anything that, uh, let's say I have a little folder on minimum wage. 
So it has little articles on minimum wage. Maybe you want to, uh, you know, expand your knowledge on that or whatever. Uh, that's all. That's all in there. But it's all in the in the Wolfram Fodler. Um, yeah. All right. So um, any uh, any questions on the procedure? If I were if I were going to do that. All right. Okay. Um, so let's talk about. Let's just you know. Talk about one of the things that we want to look at in this class, um, and that is things don't always seem what the, aren't always the way it's the, that it seems. And you just want to sort of work through and think through the logic of what's going on. So, not one of you is old enough to have ever seen a uh, an advertisement on television for cigarettes. Okay, you don't you don't you don't see the now. When I was your age, you used to see an ad for the Marlboro Man, right? He was this cool cowboy, and cowboys are pretty cool. Um, so he said, uh, you know, this cool cowboy, and he'd come riding up on his horse, and he was the he'd light up his cigarette, right? And that you'd think, wow, I'm really cool if I smoke. If you ever, how many have ever watched the Turner uh, Turner uh, Movie Channel? Are you kidding me? Okay. You got to start watching the Turner Movie Channel, right? It's got all these old movies from, you know, Cary Grant and Clark Gable and uh, you know Steve McQueen and all these old movies from the 19, even now, even some uh, some uh, ones that aren't talky, silent films back from the 1920s, etc. So anyway, if you start watching Turner Movie Channel, you'll notice that almost every movie from the 1940s up until the 1970s, at least. The hero is always lighting up a cigarette at some point, right? Uh, Clark Gable always lighting up the the, the, the cigarette. Um, uh, you know, Cary Grant lighting up the cigarette, um, and and the the the, you know, the 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 women. Uh, you know, the the you know the famous actress. Uh, she'll come along, and the guy will light her cigarette for her. Everybody's smoking. Okay. Now, you guys have never seen an ad. For smoking on television. Now, um, you might think that that's because the people who were concerned about lung cancer got a law passed to make it so you can't advertise on television. Okay, so that that seems logical, right? Now, what if you found out that? There were four major tobacco companies when this law were pa was passed, okay? And they found out that you don't increase the number of smokers by advertising on television. You just move people from smoking Lucky Strikes to, moving Mar to, to smoking Marlboros, okay? So, you four, the heads of the four tobacco companies get together and they say, Pokey Smokes Bullwinkle. How many of you have ever seen Rocky and Bullwinkle? I don't know what you guys have been doing, right? <laughs> well, what are they teaching you in high school, okay? You got to watch Rocky and Bullwinkle, okay? Um, Rocket J Squirrel, okay? Uh, anyway, um, what they get together and they say, you know what? We're spending millions of dollars advertising on television. All to do what? To keep our market share the same. If we just stopped advertising on television, we'd save all this money and we'd keep the same market share. So let's agree to just stop advertising on television. Okay? Now, you're the head of Lucky Strike, okay? And uh, you, you, you know, the Four of you get together and you agree that you're not going to advertise on television anymore because all you're doing is wasting all this money, just keeping the same market share and spending all this money. Everybody's going to save it. So you get back to your office and you call your advertising, uh, your advertising executive um, and do you tell them to stop advertising on television? No. Because if they all stop advertising on television, and you advertise, 
you're going to get all the market share, right? So all four of the executives go back and they tell their people, advertise on television because the other guys are not advertising on television and we'll gain all this market share, right? That's what, in you take Econ 415, uh, uh, public choice, uh, we do a whole section on game theory. That's what's called a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, it's, it, it's the fact that they'd all be better off if they cooperated, but each of them has what's called a dominant strategy. Each one, the best thing for them to do, no matter what the other people do, is to advertise. If the other people advertise, the best thing for them to do is advertise. If the other people don't advertise, the best thing for them to do is to advertise. So how do you solve that problem? You pass a law that says you can't advertise on television. So it was the tobacco companies that got the law that says you can't advertise on television, right? So that's something that, you know, why learn a little bit about economics um, so that you can see that, you know, see and observe, right? You can say, hey, you know what? It could have been, you know, the most obvious thing would be that it was the, you know, healthcare agencies or whatever got that law passed. But it easily could be that the tobacco company executives got that law passed. Um, now, when I, my first, uh, first year out of graduate school, um, I, was, I taught at a, a place called Mount Holyoke College. Has anybody ever heard of Mount Holyoke? Okay. Well, there are seven Ivy League. How many have heard of the Ivy League schools? Yale, okay. So there's seven all-men Ivy League schools, but there were seven what they call sister, uh, uh, sister schools. That is, they were the matchup for the Ivy Leagues, and they were all women. So that, uh, you know, Vassar and Radcliffe and, uh, and Mount Holyoke all matched up with the different um, Ivy, all-male schools. So you had the seven, they were called the seven sister schools. So Mount Holyoke was one of them, um, and um, Mount Holyoke was uh, over here, and then you went over this thing called the Notch and, uh, to get to uh, Amherst, which is a all-men's college at the time, and uh, Mount Holyoke was an all-women's college, and so they had a bus, it was called the Five College Bus, because there was three other colleges that were involved, Hampshire College, et cetera, but, so, but there were five colleges that you could ride the bus from one to the other. So um, I was on the bus one day with uh, one of the other econ profs, uh, who was a new econ prof as well, um, and uh, uh, we're sitting on the bus together uh, going to uh, Amherst to go to the library over there, and there were a bunch of girls that were going to uh, Amherst as well. Um, and so we're sitting on the bus and uh, one of the girls says, uh, she's telling us the story about how one time there was so much snow and stuff on the bus that it got stuck here and they made a bunch of the girls get off and walk over to there and the bus was able to make it over there and they picked them up over there. So she was telling the story about how bad that was, that was the girls uh, had to get off the bus and they had to walk through the snow to go over the last part of the hill and come back down and get on the dock. So, being an economics professor, um, what did we say? Instead of saying, oh wow, that sounds like a really terrible thing that happened to you, we, start, we said, well gee, you had to have 10 people get off. Right? You had to have 10 people get off and the bus seats 40. How do you choose the 10 people to get off the bus? Right? That seemed like an interesting thing to ask. Right? So instead of saying, oh my gosh, that's a terrible story, we start going, well, what's the optimal way to pick the people to get off the bus? Right? So one thing you might do is you might say, well, we'll make the freshmen get off the bus. Okay? But here's this freshman, uh, and uh, she was going to go on a date with her boyfriend at Amherst, uh, and they were just going to go inside right away, and, and she doesn't have a coat, right? And then she's got to get off the bus, okay? Or you might say, um, 
gee, uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to pick the uh, 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 person that um, is uh, uh, the last 10 people to get on, right? So they're the ones that have to get off. But th the last person that got on uh, got on because uh, she had broken her leg and she's on crutches, right? So now you're going to make her get off the bus, okay? So that's not going to work. Um, you could make it, you, I mean, you can start to think through all these different ways that you might pick the person to get off the bus, but there's always sort of unintended consequence about that. Um, so you might even do it by a lottery, okay? And you might say, well, that sounds fair. Um, what we'll do is we will uh, put uh, uh, numbers in a hat. Uh, everybody's got a number, and we'll pull 10 people out of the hat, and if your number comes up, then you're out, okay? But then again, um, one person that pulled their number out, and they just got over the flu, uh, and so they're going to be really susceptible to getting a cold uh, if they're out there, uh, and so they got to get off the bus. So as an economist, what did we say? We said, you know what? Why don't you make everybody get off the bus and then pay to get back on? Then we'll know that if you really wanted to get back on the bus, you might pay a lot to get back on the bus, right? And then you could redistribute the money, right? You could, you could just give it back to the people that are whatever. But so what happens is the people get that, uh, that are, what do you know if you make people pay to get on the bus, those people that value it the most are the ones that are going to, uh, are, are, are going to get on the bus. And if you're sort of indifferent to walking because you're, uh, you know, you're really healthy and you've been running a lot, et cetera, um, then what will happen is you will uh, not pay very much to get on the bus. And somebody that, that you know, forgot their code or whatever, uh, they're going to pay more to get on the bus. Then you might say, well, how, what if I forgot to bring my money? Right? Well, then you'd want to make it so that people could borrow, right? You could, you could, you could lend people the money to get, to get on the bus, right? Um, or um, what if we did it by, we went ahead and we said, okay, we're just going to do it by lottery because that seems the most fair. Um, well, if you do it that way, and what you ought to do is the 10 people that have to get off the bus, what do you let them do? You let them buy a seat on the bus, right? You got, you know, you pulled number 10 and you're, you're having to get off the bus, but it's worth five bucks to you to get back on the bus, and I didn't have to get off the bus, and it's only worth $3 to me to ride the bus, then you should be able to buy your way back on the bus. Okay. So what, 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 as an economist, what we're doing is we're thinking through what we, try, what we try to do is make it so that the people who value something the most are the ones that get it. Right? Now, you do have issues of inequality. You have issues of poverty. Right? Poor people are less likely to be able to buy stuff than rich people are. Okay? So it doesn't, and, and it may be that um, when we're going to talk about uh, marginal analysis, added benefit of things and the added cost of things later on, but it may be that the added benefit to you of another dollar is worth less than the added benefit to me of a dollar, et cetera. So those are sort of things that we need to think about. Um, but the point is, is that we should be able to try to allocate resources so that people who value them the most are the ones that get them. And uh, if we're going to redistribute income, we need to do it in a way that uh, has the least effect on people's behavior. So when we, if you were to take my uh, uh, public finance class, um, one of the things that we talk about is different tax schemes, et cetera. Um, and you want to try to, if you're going to, whether it would be better to um, redistribute uh, in, in law and economics class, we're going to talk about whether it's better to, uh, to redistribute through some sort of law, like a minimum wage, or is it better to just 
tax people and, uh, and give subsidies to other people, give a, have a, a SNAP program or a negative income tax or, or whatever. So the point of this whole Mount Holyoke story is to make sure that you are trying to think through, okay, if we do it this way, what's likely to happen? And think through all the unintended, what Mises, when we read liberalism, Mises is gonna talk about the unintended consequences. What are the unintended consequences of these things and how best can we uh, allocate the resources? The other thing to think about is we know that about 40,000 people a year are killed in drunk driving accidents, okay? So, how can we solve drunk driving accidents? Well, um, one thing we could do is we, can, we could make it so that if you were to have a crash, then, uh, if, then we have, what, seat belts, okay? Now, when I was very young, cars didn't have seat belts. In fact, my father installed seat belts on our 1956 Plymouth, okay? Um, uh, and, <laughs> like crazy. My daughter, we just, we're looking over our, our grandkids. You should see the seat belt, that, or the, 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 the safety seat that you gotta put in, right? The baby seat, like, you could have an asteroid land on the car, all right? And, you know, so that thing's like super designed to, whatever. But, so, um, so let's say what we do is we make it so that cars have to have padded dashes, right? And cars are required, cars are required to have airbags, right? So required, required to have airbags and the like. Now, if what I wanted to do was to make it so that there's less chance of you being injured in a, crash if you're driving. Let's think through that for a minute. Let's say that you're 21 and you're old enough to drink and you go down to the Hillsdale Brewing Company and uh, it's no longer COVID and uh, you know everybody's inside and you're drinking and drinking some beers and you have three beers uh, and you get, uh, you get behind the wheel of your car and you're deciding am I gonna, it's, you know, about a mile to drive up up to the campus, um, and you're deciding whether to drive up to the campus. Now, what you do is you get in the car, there's a padded dash, there's airbags, um, notice that you don't have uh, windows that roll up and down anymore, those things are gone, you have little buttons and stuff so it can't fly off if you get in a crash. So now you're deciding, okay, should, should I drive home? And you're looking at all this saying, yeah, you know what, I'll just, I'll just be careful, right? Now, suppose instead there was a sharpened spike at the end of the steering column, okay? You get behind the wheel, you've had three beers, and there's the sharpened spike sitting right there. You know what? You're going to be looking for the designated driver, aren't you? Right? So what are, we, what are we thinking through? If we were really thinking, if you really wanted to reduce people drunk driving, sharpened spikes at the end of the steering column would work much better, okay? So what, what, what we, uh, one of the things that we think about in economics is that um, when you reduce the chances of an accident, what happens? People take on more risk, okay? So if you want to reduce risk behavior, you don't want to make it so that you reduce the chances of uh, something bad happening to you uh, if you undertake this. Um, notice that, and again, in uh, law and economics, we have a, some discussion about insurance, okay? Um, what happens? If you're insured against something, then you're less likely to undertake behaviors that will reduce the chance of it happening. Right? Um, so that insurance does what? Insurance tends to encourage risk behavior. And insurance companies know that, right? Uh, so insurance companies will do what? They'll, they'll reduce your premium if you put a smoke alarm in, right? They'll, uh, they'll reduce your, uh, maybe they'll reduce your premiums 
uh, if you have an anti-lock brake system in your car, something like that, right? So, uh, so uh, that you know, that's uh, something that that uh, you might think about. Um, let's think about um, the uh, uh, in in, uh, in in endangered species. I'm going to think a little bit about in, endangered species. Um, if you were, yeah, well, I, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that next time, but um, just, what, well, let's go ahead and talk about it. Let's think about why, are, why do we have endangered species? One of the reasons we have endangered species is what? Because nobody owns them, right? No, if, if people, uh, now we have buffalo, okay? But the buffalo were almost extinct. And, it, and uh, it turns out that the existing buffalo that exists today uh, came about from uh, these four people that bought up private buffalo and go, went and raised, raised the buffalo. And from those, they, the, the buffalo are, uh, are, uh, are now, my daughter just got back from uh, Yellowstone, uh, and there's all sorts of buffalo running around in Yellowstone, okay? So why, you don't think that dogs are going to become extinct, right? You don't think cats are going to become extinct. Why is that? I mean, suppose that you're walking down the street and there's a dog there, uh, and you just, uh, uh, you take out a pistol and you just shoot the thing, right? Somebody's going to come up and say, wait a minute, that was my dog you just shot, right? You can't do that. But if nobody owns the buffalo, what's going to happen? You're going to shoot the buffalo, right? In fact, if you sort of think about it, suppose that you're Buffalo Bill, and uh, you're out there, and you know that you're shooting too many buffalo. Right there, you're going to wipe out the buffalo. You're shooting the buffalo. So you're standing there and you're thinking, so a buffalo's coming by and you go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to let that buffalo go because I'm really worried about buffaloes becoming, you know, running out of buffalo. 100 yards down the road, what's going to happen? Somebody else is going to shoot it, <laughs> right? So even if you know that you're going to cause the buffalo to become extinct by shooting the buffalo, you're going to shoot it anyway, because nobody owns it. And if nobody owns it, then somebody else is going to shoot it. And so if you sort of think through this, if you want to save endangered species, what do you need to have happen? You need to somebody to own it, right? If you want to save the whales, you need to give the whales to ExxonMobil, all right? And then ExxonMobil will do what? They'll tag the whales. Right? And they'll be watching where the whales are, and they'll be taking care of the whales. Okay? Um, if uh, a couple years ago, I went to uh, this uh, friend of ours, um, we got a, uh, his, his wife was running for a judge um, here in Hillsdale, and they went to a National Rifle Association uh, fundraiser thing and bought a, uh, a lottery uh, on a four-person hunt in South Africa, okay? Four-person safari hunting in South Africa. So they ended up winning it, and really cheap. And so they called my wife and I and said, hey, you want to go to South Africa, and we'll go on this hunting safari. And so uh, we said, yeah. And in fact, if you come up to my office, you will see um, this uh, uh, animal that I, that, that I shot, um, and uh, the, um, it's got a broken horn on it, anyway, um, anyway, if you, you come up there, you can take a look at it, uh, it's an impala, um, but um, the way the thing worked was, when you got there, you had to, you had to shoot at least two animals, and you had to pay for the animals that you shot. And the animals have different prices to them. Well, I shot an impala and a warthog. 
And you can guess that those were the cheapest animals to shoot, okay? I had to pay extra for my wife not to shoot. She didn't want to hunt. So I had to pay extra. I had to pay like $1,500 uh, so that she didn't have to hunt an animal. Because the way the thing worked was that the, and they, they put you on these um, really large, uh, you know, 20,000 acre ranches basically that are fenced off, okay? And then there's animals on there. And if you choose you want to hunt this kind of animal, they'll put you on this one. And if you want to hit this kind of animal, they'll put you on another one, et cetera. So, um, uh, giraffes cost uh, like something like $4,000 to shoot a giraffe. Guess what? There was lots of giraffes, okay? Um, why was that? Because you could get the, the it, it worked through the, 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 uh, the safari company and the owners of the property, et cetera. And then guess what? There were properties that did what? Raised giraffes, <laughs> right? You ain't, I got news for you. You ain't gonna run out of giraffes in South Africa. Not when you get $3,000 for one, right? So if you go to South Africa, what do you have? You're, you, you, you have, actually you have uh, large plantations that are fenced in where they're raising animals. You have the same thing in the United States where you can go on, I don't know if you ever heard about it, but you can have exotic hunting in Texas, for example. Um, and uh, what they found out was when they were going, uh, when, when um, uh, in, uh, in Africa, when uh, people were granted the rights to own elephants, guess what? They started looking for after the, uh, and going after the poachers, and they didn't just shoot the elephants because people would come and hunt the elephants, right? And so once you see that people are owning elephants, what do you find? Places where people own elephants, elephants are rising. Yeah. So if it costs four thousand dollars, say, to shoot the giraffe, and as a result, people don't want to shoot the giraffes, and there's a lot of giraffes, wouldn't that drive the price of shooting the giraffes down? Well, if there were more people that, uh, if if the price of giraffes is too high then what would happen is fewer people would want to hunt the giraffes, and then guess what? I'd grow less giraffes. So the, 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 when we'll, we'll do demand and supply analysis to show what's gonna happen, but you're right. If, 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 the, if, if the price of giraffes is set too high, then what will happen? There'll be excess supply of giraffes, uh, in which case they'll start making less giraffes, and the price of giraffes will start to fall, and then more people will hunt the giraffes. But the point here is, is that anything, any animal that nobody owns is gonna be more subject to extinction than, uh, than animals that people, uh, uh, that, that people own. Cows are not gonna become extinct, right? People own them. Now, people don't own cockroaches, and there's lots of cockroaches, okay? So uh, maybe cockroaches aren't gonna come extinct. Um, but if there's something that you're worried about extinction, then it makes sense to have somebody own them. And if, some, if uh, 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 right now there's an issue about, for example, honeybees, right? And whether honeybees are becoming extinct, et cetera. Uh, and so who's, who's working on saving the honeybees? People who own Honeybees, right? Like if you are a farmer, uh, you can have, somebody can, I don't know if you've ever driven by uh, uh, orchards and the like, you'll see where there's these uh, beehives that people, you know, there are companies that own honeybees and they come and beekeepers go put them out there. And so the beekeepers are the ones that are thinking about that. But somebody had a question, yeah. Well, you could you could have a you could have a fine for shooting the animals, in which maybe you're saying that the government owns the animals and they're going to charge you for shooting one. Okay. Now, the problem is how. In fact, it's against the law 
to go out and shoot these animals anyway. And they're, what are they called? Poachers. Okay? There's a movie, I don't know if you ever saw this movie, it's called, uh, uh, Sigourney Weaver is in it, and it's called uh, Gorillas That Are Pissed. Um, no, it's Gorillas in the Mist. Um, <laughs> and uh, what, what it's about, it's, it's, uh, spoiler alert, the gorillas get killed at the end by poachers, okay? Um, and why is that? You know from the beginning, if you're an economist, you're looking around, you're going, nobody owns the darn, elef or, uh, 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 the darn gorillas. Um, you've got them in this government agency, and there's lots of poachers and not too many government people out there trying to, trying to make sure that the poachers aren't killing them, right? Um, we're, and, and so that if you, if you had the, you know, if uh, you know, some major corporation owned all the gorillas, right? They'd have people there uh, making sure that the poachers don't do it. And in fact, that's what they found with regard to elephants in places where the people that uh, live on the properties, et cetera, when they, if they own the elephants, they go out and make sure that the poachers aren't, aren't there. And you're not seeing a, uh, a threat of extinction in, in those areas. Yeah. Nowadays. And what, ha what, you know, people might say, well, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to Exxon anymore, anymore. Yes, exactly. Because that will affect Exxon's, the demand for Exxon's oil. Yeah. Well, what value is it to Exxon to own a bunch of Because yeah. they'll sell, they'll, you know, if whales have any value, they'll sell them to somebody, right, for whale oil or whatever. They'll grow more oil and will grow more, you know, grow more whales, et cetera, right? Um, so, the, I mean, if, if somebody owns them and they have any value, if there's no value to them, right, then we don't care if they go away anyway, right? The only reason that you, you must think there's some value to the whales, otherwise, you know, maybe Walt Disney wants them to be able to, to, to look, like, if, you, if, if you're worried about the manatee and, well, actually, we're out of time here. But if you own the manatee, then if Walt Disney owned the manatee, what would happen? You'd be going through the glass bottom boat, you know, paying 50 bucks to go on the glass bottom boat to look at the manatees, and Walt Disney would make sure that they didn't have it. All right, so for um, Friday, uh, we, will, um, we will be done with uh, this first uh, introductory part, and we're going to start looking at... Um, uh, in a capitalist manifesto, so you might uh, take a look at the at least uh, chapter one and chapter two of uh, capitalist manifesto, and we'll probably notice that we've already talked about the economist on a bus. Um, so chapter three on demand is probably the chapter that you want to be looking for. So make sure you've read through, let's say, the first three chapters. Again, I don't, I don't sort of tell you exactly what to do. You just sort of follow along along the way, all right?